you for joining me in Hodes Career Info, the program where career professionals from across the globe meet to empower you to succeed. This program is brought to you by Right Career Fit. Feeling stuck or uncertain in your career path? Have that very important conversation with a career professional. Book your appointment with any of the career professionals interviewed on this program or with me, Hoda, at rightcareerfit.com. Purpose is a life structuring aim. So if you have purpose, it actually helps you to understand, okay, which career choices should I make or not make? We worked for this for the longest time and then all of a sudden we achieved this and then we realized like, yeah, was that it? Isn't there anything more? Midlife crisis is a very popular myth and a little bit of an excuse sometimes. I make the stereotype happen by adjusting my actions to it. If you're truly authentically yourself, and that's my belief, I believe that people engage you based on who you are. Thank you again for joining me in season two of Hoda's Career Info, your career program where career professionals from across the globe share career tips and personal stories to help you successfully navigate your career. I am Hoda, your host. I look forward to another season of career chats with international career professionals who will inspire you to take your journey to the next level. My guest today is Dr. Ingo Raut. Dr. Ingo is a coach and founder of the School of Becoming, where he supports people in navigating life-changing career transitions. He is a professor at Rotman School of Management in Toronto, an IE Business School in Madrid, teaching professional and leadership development. Ingo changed careers more than a dozen times, relocated 37 times, and sold everything he had three times. Fascinated by the experience, he developed a passion for professional development and found purpose supporting others going through career transitions. A recent dad, Ingo loves spending time with his family, working out, listening to music, running life experiments, and having deep conversations over a glass of wine. In our career chat today, Dr. Ingo and I will be talking about ageism, about what does it mean to go through midlife crisis, as well as career transitions, and so much more. Let's listen and together learn from Dr. Ingo's various career transitions. Thank you, Dr. Ingo Raut, for joining me today in Hades Kedir Info. It's a pleasure to have you uh, in this episode. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Dr. Ingo, part of this uh, show uh, or this program is to share personal definitions of key career terms. You know, career terms that have probably guided your career journey so far uh, because the purpose is to educate people on through personal stories. So what would be your career term and how has it affected your career journey? Ooh, um, so I've been reflecting on this a lot. I think ever since I started out to study, I was always trying to find a way to make a difference. And uh, for me, that is encapsulated in purpose. So for me, purpose is a life structuring aim. So if you have purpose, it actually helps you to understand, okay, which career choices should I make or not make? Which direction should I go? Which country should I live in? Which opportunity should I say yes or no to? And in my life, I had way too many jobs. Um, I counted job titles once, it was over a dozen. And um, like I did, for example, I'm originally from Germany. I had to do military service. So I was joining the army armed forces. And then at another time I was a camera assistant and then I was a designer and I was a consultant and I was a um, doctoral student and I was a professor and I was a programmer. And all the time I had this question, this nagging question was like, why am I doing this? 
And so purpose became one of the things that I got really fascinated with um, because I wanted to understand, okay, what is that for me? Especially when you change a lot in your life, like what is your purpose, right? Because you could say, well, there's nothing. Um, but yeah, so I've developed this fascination with purpose as a life structuring aim. And uh, here there are a couple of wonderful people out there, uh, William DeMone, Stanford University, or Victor Strescher from, um, I think, uh, University of Michigan, both did like great work on the idea or on this concept of purpose. And um, if you want a definition, it's um, purpose is something that's meaningful to the self while being consequential to the world beyond the self. And that's a definition by William Damone. And I love this because it tells us that two like separate parts or two parts that we have to figure out in order to have purpose in our lives. And by the way, it can show up in multiple ways. So that doesn't have to be big. It can be with your family or friends um, or in other instances. And like when it comes to my purpose, I realize that I love to explore. I love to learn new things and I love to engage in situations that are uncomfortable and, and challenging. And so that's meaningful to me. But then the question is, what is consequential to the world beyond the self? Like, where do you apply yourself to? And for me, that has been or has become this field of career transitions because I had so many myself, so it's meaningful to me, but I also recognize this challenge, this unique period in time um, that we all thrive to get through and trying to like get through coming out in a better way than we started. And within this period of like high uncertainty and doubt, I think purpose can help us to navigate. And so for me, purpose is one of these terms that I um, wholeheartedly believe in and I believe that it can guide us a little bit and help us find our ways to apply ourselves in a way that's meaningful to us and to others. I love how you connected uh, the career purpose with the career transition because really we are always I think going through the transition uh, if, if we think about it and, and your journey really it illustrates this how you've really transitioned from so many opportunities to to get to where you're at uh, so thank you for taking on this challenge of defining it as well and sharing your personal definition of career purpose uh, you have mentioned a little bit about your journey and this would be typically my next question is can you share with the audience your personal story and perhaps that part you would like to highlight and embedded with it any message that you think someone would benefit watching this program? Wow, okay. Um, the story is pretty long, so I will spare you like most of the details, but um, I think when it comes to the, the summary of it, so as I already mentioned, I had a couple of careers and jobs and I realized that the most interesting or like for me like most engaging part was always the beginning i love learning and i love a good challenge and these two things are typically present when you start in a new career however over time when i realized like oh yeah i got this and it works for me i started to doubt what i was doing and i started to doubt that it was enough and partially driven by this idea of purpose and partially driven by feeling I wasn't good enough, what I was doing wasn't good enough, I ventured into the next thing. So you could say like, it's like, I was driven by two things and I could express it as like, I was always wanting to like have a bigger impact that would be very good. Or I could say, well, I was always driven by not feeling good enough. And both stories are equally true. And like for me that, became kind of something that really fascinated me. And recognizing this also gives you some power because sometimes we get so addicted to our emotional state that we feel like we have to comply to it or like all the time. So I always felt like if I'm not challenged, if I feel like I'm good enough, there's something wrong with what I'm doing. That's a very like, um, challenging thought to have and like it has accompanied me for the most like for most of my life through all of these challenges through all of these changes and like it wasn't the nicest thing because you I always felt like I wasn't good enough I wasn't there yet my impact wasn't big enough and the only thing that helped me and that was later in my I would say my 30s like later 30s early 40s made me like reflect on okay when am I 
when I when am I good enough? What is good enough for me? And when do I recognize that I have impact? And when do I recognize that I doing something worthwhile? Because if like I kept I would have kept on going, I would have kept on changing careers and like moving on to the next thing. And I I won't lie, it still kindles me like to think about like exploring different careers and opportunities. I kind of love doing that. Um, but when I look back at my life, it got me to so many places and um, like meet so many people, which I'm really thankful for. So there's an upside, but it's also a downside because it never allowed me to build anything. I never like had a real home. I like moved 37 times in like a period of like a little bit over 20 years, which is insane. I lived in seven countries. I made friends and then like tried to hold on to them, but moving to a different country, like I had to make new friends. So with with darkness comes uh, no what's the saying with um with light comes shadow kind of thing and so yeah like i think that's something that i took away from it that there's always two sides to anything that i do and what i do right now is i came to realize that i want to have something that um, is a little bit more lasting so with my girlfriend we bought a house and um, currently in my office super happy about it uh, we um, recently like welcomed our son our firstborn into this world which is amazing uh, has been a challenging journey but I'm so happy seeing him every day and like having something I can continuously dedicate myself to and maybe it's the time of my life in terms of like how I changed as an individual but right now I really enjoy like a steadiness and the ability to not have to change but like think about transitions think about change think about purpose in a way that enables others and um, not like turning my life around once again so yeah it's like sometimes it's I guess to end this and to answer your question sometimes it's just good where you are and you don't realize it until you embrace it well congratulations on the arrival of your baby thank you uh, and um you know what your journey is probably an adventure that many people dream of taking <laughs> <laughs> particularly when i get clients who feel stuck in where they are because they had been doing the same job for 10 mm -hmm. years or because they you know went to university and followed the uh, expected path uh they'd be like i want to do this but i'm too scared i don't know that i can step out and change right. this path right now but i'm not happy where i'm at Mm. Uh, you kind of reverse the trend by kind of doing all these exploration. Now you've got into a point where you're ready to settle down. Uh, so thank you for sharing that so people can see the two sides of, of doing things like that. Um, you and I have talked about what I would call lifelong learning, but you taught me something new and you're calling it long life learning. So can you tell me your understanding of life, long life learning and where you got the idea for that? Yeah, so um, as you pointed out, I, I, I guess I love adventure. I still do. And in the beginning of 2020, I um, joined uh, an institution called the Modern Elder Academy in Baja, um, Southern California, which is in Mexico. And this institution is dedicated to help people who are about to retire. Um, so 50 onwards, so later midlife, if you like, or midlife, to navigate midlife. Because as it turns out in midlife, which is a very interesting period of time, we think in our modern society, we're fully developed, we are there. And Oda, I know a little bit about your story. And like, I know that we know we're not there yet, right? There's like, somehow it felt like this promise that everything's gonna be all right. And we are like, just feeling great. And we're at the height of our careers. We have everything figured out and we have the perfect life. And we work for this for the longest time. And then all of a sudden we achieve this and then we realized like, yeah, was that it? Isn't there anything more? And um, I had a conversation with one of the founders, Chip Conley, um, who loves to play with words. He's really remarkable when it comes to that. And he has written a couple of really interesting books. Can only recommend your like viewership to, um, or listenership to actually check them out. Um, so we sat down and had a conversation and we wanted to like cast a new light on midlife. Because what comes to mind when we talk about the midlife for most people is midlife crisis, right? And it's like, okay, why is this happening? And is this happening? And is it really that bad? And when you look at it, midlife crisis is a very popular myth. 
and a little bit of an excuse sometimes. If you look at life and how we experience midlife, um, it's actually not that bad. Most of us are pretty happy. Um, when you look at the U-curve of happiness, which is one of the things um, that we did, uh, like uh, mentioned in that white paper, which can you can download, by the way, just Google it, or um, maybe you can include it in the show notes for that. Um, you see that there is like a, a low point in happiness over our lifetime development, which is somewhere around 46. And so what happens is until 46, like happiness declines. And then after 46, happiness increases steadily. It's not a lot, but enough for us to say, well, you know, if it's, if it's, is it really that bad? And like, do we have to be afraid of age or aging? Is the journey really over or are there new things coming? And when we looked into the research, we realized there is a lot to learn and a lot to discover and a lot to do when you uh, progress into later stages of life. Unfortunately, as a society, we haven't embraced that. As I said before, we thought like we had reached our peak in our 40s. And that's like given like what we had in the past in terms of life expectancy where people live to 60s, that's totally fine. But nowadays, like, you live or you can potentially live to 100 years old. And so you like at 50, like have 50 more years. That's a lot of lifetime. So what do you want to do with it? And we said, because nobody taught us that, nobody educated in how to navigate life post, like your first education, your first like maybe marriage or relationship and house, which is the stereotype, like we never got to venture on. And long life learning is learning for a long life, learn, learning to live a long and satisfying life. And um, Chip Connolly invited me to write this white paper with him when I was down in Baja, California. And we dedicated um, a couple of months to read all the paper, read all the research on midlife and um, like try to paint a new picture on what that period could be like and what are the advantage actually of aging. So um, that's a little bit about long life learning and how it's different from lifelong learning, which is continuously educating yourself, usually in regards to like keeping up with the labor market. And for us, it was more about continuously educating yourself in order to live a fulfilled and hopefully um, happy life. Um, this is very interesting research. And yes, I would love to share it in the links uh, at the bottom, but um you highlight the over 50 uh, the reality is the social uh, environment we live in does not welcome us working beyond 60 or maybe sometimes 65 if we're lucky and we're then cast to the like 70 who's gonna hire a 70 year old but i your perspective is let's focus on the happiness and and contentment in life i guess from that perspective the long life learning becomes yeah. viable and I think it's a legitimate question, especially given the current environment that we are in. But if you look at the overall trends, like our societies are becoming older, which means that people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s have more and more say because they represent bigger parts of the population. It won't be a change overnight, but it will change bit by bit by bit. Further, like we have a decline in um, talent. So right now, there are a couple of jobs where people desperately look for people that can fill these roles. And we also see a trend from, as Chip Conley puts it, from software to soft skills. And we know for a fact that people with more life experience have more of those. So you could take all this and argue that in the long term, like we will need people who are like more advanced in age to take positions, to take responsibility, to share their wisdom, to like tap into their unique uh, abilities and skills and also develop them. It's also responsibility. But I believe that given what is going on right now is like there will be more demand for people and this outdated image of like we can or should retire because first it was like you can't retire with 60 and it was great. But now it's like you have to retire with 60 something. And you're like, really, that was it? Like that is something that will get hopefully eradicated. Plus there are plenty of programs um, that we found in our research that already offer um, education to support people who work through this transition to find their encore career. So if you Google encore career, there's a lot of fantastic work that has been 
done and uh, a lot of programs uh, ranging from like nonprofits to universities like Harvard, for example, that offer these programs for people to continue their uh, development and their engagement in the world and apply all they have learned, all their wisdom, all their skills and abilities in new ways beneficial to themselves and society. Um, this is going to be great news for many of my clients who were retired from their jobs at 60 or 65. And then they're thinking uh, they worked in professional, you know, as professionals. And so they don't want to go work in retail or baristas mm -hmm. or, uh, but they can't seem to find that balance uh, of what do I do now? I'm 65 and I'm home. I still want to stay like cognitively alert and work, right. uh, but no one will hire me. So uh, I will use that. Encore, you said, what did you? Is it yeah, Encore? Encore would be the term that I would Google. Um, there is uh, a handbook of Encore uh, for Encore careers by, forgot her name, Marcy Up Uproller, I think, a matter at uh, MEA. So that is a book like worth checking out, I think. And then there are a couple of programs you can find when you Google Encore uh, career. I'm sure there's like, I think um, there are a couple of books that um, where you can read. And I I would challenge if you, if you're listening to us right now, and if you like have this thought, like there is no way there is like society, like to society, I'm, I'm not like somebody that can contribute anymore. And you have these stereotypes internalized. Um, I think one thing that helped me in my life was always to challenge the stereotype because I make the stereotype happen by adjusting my actions to it. And to give you an example, when I like I was a designer at one point and being a designer in Germany and being dyslexic, the likelihood of you doing a PhD is pretty low. In fact, most people will tell you it's not possible. Your education doesn't um, put you uh, up for scientific research. You have to do another degree or you have to whatever, but it's not possible for you to do a PhD. That's what I got told. Now, by accident and stubbornness, I discovered that there was an exemption to the rule, which was if any professor at any university um, thinks you are worthy or capable of pursuing a PhD, they can make an exemption for you. But that wasn't public knowledge at the time and I still don't think it is. So like through that, I found a loophole. I found a way for myself. But if I would have fall prey to like the stereotype and the idea of as a designer, you're not capable of, or as a dyslexic person, you shouldn't pursue, right? I wouldn't have gotten to where I am. And I think there's another thing that that plays into this. We are largely trained to perceive as or as if our personalities are fixed and as if like our past is our future. And if you really believe that, then, well, that might be a pretty bleak outlook on life because it means that your past dictates your future and dictates what you can do next and also limits what you can do next. But through all our life, we have been changing. We have been adapting. We have been like venturing into new careers, into new relationships, into new like society, parts of society or um, into new um, roles, like socially as well as professionally. And if you look at your own life, your own life speaks, a, speaks like a language of transition, of change, of development, of your ability to adapt and develop yourself. And so I believe that once we see that for ourselves, we can find the strength to challenge these like stereotypes and can find ways to engage. And yes, it might not be the traditional kind of labor market and applying for job kind of game that we played throughout our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and so on. But there might be other ways to engage and find opportunities to engage. And as I mentioned before, there are like new opportunities and ways to find these uh, possibilities for us. Uh, well, you gave an incredible example of uh, stepping out of these stereotypes. Uh, but and usually I, I know that as you as I hear you talking, you know, with children, we say, you know, you can't step out of that stereotype. But we rarely apply it to the older generation where, you know, you're in retirement, you can be outside of that stereotype of retirement. So 
um, that's a very uh, good example of uh, probably, but I mean, you're not that old. <laughs> you are not <laughs> into the 50 plus generation. And so no, I'm not. Um, uh, I am uh, impressed that you have that, you know, advanced thought to be able to be a part of that institute that you joined and uh, see things ahead of time. But perhaps think, it's your adventurous experience. <laughs> yeah, I think um, there's always ageism and age is a matter of perspective. When I started my PhD with, um, I think, 34 at the time or 32, I can't remember, I considered myself old because everybody around me was in their early 20s just like had their masters and continued with their education and like i felt like oh my god like will i be able to do this and oda i know you you started also like going back to university later in life right and there's all these doubts that come up and like will i be able to learn will i be good enough like oh they're they're so advanced they have all these like they're so agile in their minds they have been learning for the last 10 years and i have been out of school or out of university for 10 or 20 years right so these things are a natural part of pursuing anything new and they are meant to keep us safe. And I think this is where most of us struggle a little bit because we think that our doubts and fears are justified and to a large extent they might be, but they are not meant to empower us. They're meant to keep us in a safe environment that allows us to continue the way we have been. And I think when it comes to any transition at any age, like the hard part is not necessarily to find a new thing. The hard part is to work on yourself and develop yourself to become that new thing. And if I have been doing something for the last 20 years or last 10 years or 30 years, then it becomes incredibly hard because what I have to do is I have to challenge myself, my understanding of self, my identity. And with that, a whole lot of the security that I experience in life. And so I think that when you want to push beyond like retirement and say like you know what like i'm ready to do more i have more in me then the challenge is not only that like to fight ageism and become recognized as somebody that can still contribute but also to question like how do i want to contribute how do i want to apply myself and kind of engage in this discovery process that allows you to find your strength and your kind of um, dedication in moving forward. Because it might not be the role that you're used to have. It might not be the status that you used to have. It might not be the security that you used to have. You might start somewhere where you feel like insecure, where you feel like challenged, where you feel like you're back at square one. And I think here, like the thinking has to change a little bit, at least it's from my own experience. What I realized is that when I started anything new, I was thinking about the end goal. I wanted to be X, a PhD. I wanted to be a designer. I wanted to be, have a certain rank in the military, whatever it was. What I was thinking less about was the experience, which makes 99% of the time that I need to go through to get there. And recognizing that the experience that I need to go through and like go through every day is like the thing I'm like actually wanting. So to give you an example, it's very, it's very abstract, but the reality of doing research these days or work at a university is the motto publish or perish. So you have to publish a lot, no matter if it makes sense to you or not, but this is your currency in that environment. What I didn't understand when I started my PhD was that, well, I had to publish, I had to write. I had, it was like one thing to have ideas and learn, which is part of it and do interviews and like travel the world and like engage with different communities, which is super fascinating. But then there's also this other side of having to write. In the beginning, I still remember I had this interview, um, my supervisor asked me, do you like to read? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, do you like to write? And I said, yeah, but I knew it was a lie <laughs> at that point. And then I was thinking, okay, like at some point I have to do that. And I had to find my way to like writing. And that asked of me to change my attitude towards writing. And that was a tricky thing because for the most time or the longest period of my life, I believed that writing wasn't necessary, um, that I was bad at writing and that it was something that's not pleasant. And so conflicted 
in that situation, I had to find a way to actually make writing into something that I like to do. And that was challenging. And that's just an example of how any change at any age requires us to question ourselves, to question our beliefs and identities. Because to that point, I believed like I'm not a writer and I disregarded writing. And part of my identity was built on that disregard. And all of a sudden I had to say, well, I like writing and I had to admit that I'm not good at it. And I had to believe that I can become better at it. And that was difficult. But luckily, like I had great uh, supervisors, a great environment, and like one amazing educator at the university, she gave uh, or she taught um, a structured writing course. And through her, I discovered my love for writing because she taught me how to write and how writing was not a mystery and how I could be capable of doing great academic work and becoming a better writer. But like it had to start with frustration and anxiety and feeling insignificant and feeling like out of place, a little odd, like I was winging it and it didn't feel great. But once I applied myself and I started to engage in the journey and realized how I made, like became better step by step by step and celebrate these small victories, I started to enjoy the process. I started to enjoy the way more. And all of a sudden, like, the way became the goal, like the engagement became what satisfied me, not so much the result of doing a PhD. And I still remember one day, one of my supervisors, he was like, Ingo, we got to have a conversation. Why are you doing this? Are you doing this for the title? Or are you doing this because you want to create something worth reading? And like, that was a kind of a really smart question. Uh, Jan, my supervisor at the time, asked me. And I said, well, I want to write something worth reading. And so I owned it to myself, as well as my supervisor, as well as to the community I was researching and like wanting to support to write something worth reading that was insightful and to the best of my abilities. And I think that was another thing that encouraged me and supported me on that path because I knew, knew that Every time I improve my writing, I will be better able to serve that community. Well, thank you for giving the detailed example. And I appreciate that as you're talking, I'm thinking of my own journey. And like you're saying, uh, you already have your own uh, fears and anxieties about moving forward in that challenge that you chose to take, to take on. But you really need those support people around you for sure to tell you you can do it. Uh, and so you can push the naysayers out of the way and who say you can't do it. Um, so this was a very, very good detailed answer. Thank you. Um, these were all the questions I have for you, uh, Dr. Ingo, today. Uh, I appreciate your time, but was there something you would like to wrap up, some sort of advice for those listening? One more tip you gave a lot already so we can wrap up with. I think like one tip that I started to give recently um, when it comes to career transitions and doing the thing that you love doing. I think for me going through my transitions and having the experience that I had when working with people on a topic, enabling my students and reading the research, I think it comes down to two things. First of all, it's showing up authentically and then finding a room that you are appreciated in for who you are authentically and that wants to engage you based on who you are authentically which requires opening a lot of doors so what i mean by that is that we are very trained to look for the solution the next job out there but it actually starts with us it starts with us understanding what makes us happy what feels meaningful what do i love to engage in what do i what am i passionate about what kind of like satisfies me and makes me happy while doing it, not just for the result, but for the, for the experience of engaging in that. And that does, is not, usually not a job. It's, it comes down to values and strengths and things you love doing. It could be writing, it could be painting, it could be talking to people, having engaging conversations, and it could be values like freedom or like equality or whatever your values are. So once you have that, once you know what that is, it's on us to show up authentically as that person. And with every room that we enter in that way, and that could be a conversation you have with a friend or a conversation you can have with a stranger or like in an interview, 
or like online. With every conversation you practice yourself, you will be seen and invite others into your life that see you for who you are. And if you're truly authentically yourself, and that's my belief, I believe that people engage you based on who you are. And so if you get into the right room, if you get into the right environment and people see you for who you are authentically, people see how you are passionate about what you're talking about, how you want to engage. If it resonates with them, they will start to engage you. If it doesn't resonate with them, you will see the signs. And then it's not about like being sad. It's more about like for me, at least recognizing, okay, I'm not at the right, in the right room. Let's do them and myself a favor and let's move to the next room because they're in a definite amount of rooms. And I believe that these two things, showing up authentically and finding the right room, are key to actually find a fulfilling and meaningful and happy life. So that's the last thing I want to share. This is great advice. And it's really uh, throughout your message, like throughout the whole conversation today, it's really about getting to know yourself. It, you just said show up authentically who you are not to be afraid to show who you are so thank you so much for your time dr ingo uh, i'm sure we'll have more kiddish conversations you and i uh, i appreciate your being on this program but i'm very much looking forward to that and um thank you so much for having me and uh, for inviting me to share a little bit of what i've experienced with your questions <music>